Becerra, and Bobby actually wrote in uh, with a story, uh, and uh, I thought it was fantastic, and I booked her right away. The first time I actually met her was not far from here in Echo Park when I was hanging up flyers to promote a show, and uh, she had stopped me and recognized the flyers and said, oh, I ride the bus, and she came to the show, and uh, then uh, she wrote in and uh, did the show at the library, and now we have her here today uh, on Busted Los Angeles, the web show, and I'm really glad to have her. Uh, so please welcome Bobby Becerra. Take it away, Bobby. Thank you, Scott. Um, I am an LA native, and I have been on the bus uh, for over 40 years, uh, so I do have a lot of stories that I could share. Um, I'm going to start with the probably the most important story that I remember. It um, actually happened many years ago when I was in my early 20s, and it's always um, stayed with me as an important experience, and that's the one I want to share. I was working over on Wilshire and Fairfax over near the old May Company building, and I was living over here near, near Echo Park, and every day after work, I'd jump on the Fairfax bus and then transfer over to the Sunset bus. And one night, just as usual, um, I was working. I worked a little bit late. I was a little tired. And so I headed out and went down to the bus stop, got on the Fairfax bus as usual. It's a little crowded, you know, it's uh, rush hour. Uh, standing room over only, but not really crowded. So I got on and kind of took a place. And again, I'm, I'm a little tired, I'm a little uneasy, but once I got on the bus, I, I felt a little more discomfort. So I just kind of stood there, even though a seat opened up pretty quickly, I just stayed standing just so I could kind of get a sense of why I was so uncomfortable. So we're, we're moving on, and I'm trying to figure out exactly why I'm so uh, nervous. I'm looking around. I, I don't really feel threatened. Uh, I mean, folks on LA buses sometimes look a little strange, but for the most part, they're, they're not dangerous. Um, but still, there's something bothering me. So I decide to look around and kind of watch the people on the bus and try to figure out why I'm feeling so uncomfortable. And so I look, I'm in the middle of the bus, I look a little bit toward the front, and I see these two people sitting there, older, well, kind of middle-aged guy in his 40s, next to this young girl who I'd say is about 12. And I, I'm realizing that this is the source of my discomfort. I'm, I'm listening, and anyone who's, who's paying attention, you hear what you think is a two-way conversation, a dialogue with questions and answers and some kind of communication. But when you look, the body language is so different. Uh, the guy is sort of leaning in as though he's familiar, but this young girl is so tight in her body and so uncomfortable that I'm starting to wonder if something's wrong here. So I'm looking around and I'm trying to pay attention to how everyone else is responding. Honestly, most people are ignoring. They're not paying any attention. They're in their own worlds. But I do see that there is one other woman, a little older Hispanic lady, who is also watching this conversation. So it, it just validates what I'm feeling, and I know that there's something wrong here. So. I, I need to do something. So I go up and I stand next to the girl and I'm intentionally ignoring the guy sitting next to her. I don't, I don't like his energy. So I talk just to her and I ask her, hey, do you know this guy? And her response, she looks up to me. She's answering me in a nonverbal way. She has that face, you know, we've all been young and uncomfortable but she has that look of, I just don't know what to do here. So, okay, she's validated that something's wrong. She's trusting me by answering me, so now I, I have to follow through and, and help her get out of the situation. So I ask her again, do you know this guy? Because if you don't, you can get up 
and you can go. You don't have to talk to him. So she finally, with that, she said, no, I, I don't know him. So, okay, I said, well, if you want to, you can get up and get off of the bus at the next stop with me. The bus will go away with the guy. And if he follows us, then we'll call the police and let them deal with him. And I'm speaking directly to her. I'm intentionally ignoring him. But I'm speaking strongly enough for him to hear me and honestly everybody on the bus to hear me. So it gave her enough confidence and a love, enough uh, feeling of safety to be able to say, yes, she wants to get up. So she did, she got up, and we positioned so that she's behind me, I'm between her and this guy, and we wait till the next stop. We're at Melrose, we get off the bus, we watch the bus go away with the guy on it. So once we get out, I feel a sense of relief that she trusted me, I'm glad that we're off, and, and I know that she's gonna get on the next bus in just a few minutes, so I have sort of this urgency and this real sense of protection to give her an awful lot of information in just a few minutes that we have. So I'm asking her things like, okay, it's dark. Are, is somebody going to meet you? W where are you going? Uh, this was before cell phones, so I'm asking her, at your stop, where's the pay phone? Uh, her brother was supposed to meet her, so I'm asking, what if your brother's not there? What are you going to do? So I'm giving her lots and lots of information, asking a lot of questions. And honestly, I don't know if she remembers any of it. And I wasn't too concerned about the detail, but I wanted her to have an experience that told her that if she's uncomfortable, she can do something to get out of a situation. And again, this has happened over 20 years ago, but I, I actually think about that young girl a lot, and I hope that over the years she's been able to recall an experience of being able to look at a situation, ask for some help, and take an offering whenever it was available. Thank you. Which, um